Well, all the best is, is very special because um, they don't sound really dated. And listening to all the mixes there, they feel now, they, they feel current. I'm very proud when I listen to them and to know that I'm giving this work out because it represents a part of my life from the past all the way up until now. Proud of the fact that it's still good quality and, um, and that even with the new songs, where the, the, the blend of the vocals are still just as strong and as vibrant. I think it's a, a piece that, that, that I can be proud of. Yeah, sometimes it doesn't have to be uh, a song that I can necessarily relate to in terms of experience. It just has to be something lyrically that I like. Like, uh, for instance, um, sometimes very simple, simple, simple songs that, that only has a, a small message. Actually, I don't like autobiographical songs because I've done enough of those. I sometimes tire of the blues. So I like songs that are kind of relative. They're, they're kind of go both ways, for the young, for the old, for the now. And um, it's very hard to explain, but the music is also very important to me. Um, it's not just the lyrics, it's, it's the music as well, because that motivates me to really get into delivering the song. I think that says how I feel about the early stages of the once I receive the demos. and It is a mixture of the music and the lyrics, but it doesn't have to have a, a strong, strong meaning. It can be very simple, but a feeling is, definitely has to. Something has to be projected for me to feel that, mm, this song feels good. Or sometimes they don't have that, but I know that they have the potentials of having that. <laughs> that was another persuasive song coming from Roger Davis, my manager. Uh, it uh, it had an, a stale old feeling to it when I first got the demo, and I didn't like it at all. I was very upset because I thought, can a record company not give me something current, something to show that I'm up to date? I mean, I, do I have to sing a certain type of song the rest of my life? I was very, very upset. And then, of course, Roger said, uh, I think... There's a kid that's going to work with you on the song and going to bring it to life. And I said, well, you know, I'm always open to sing a song. I said, but this is one that I'm really upset with because I'm not happy with this material. I want something modern. I want something that works with, with today's music. I mean, it didn't have to be a rapping song or hip hop, but uh, open arms. Uh, how long do I have to be here with open arms? <laughs> and then the track came and then I put on a vocal and then the song came to life for me. So I like it now. I was really surprised when I arrived at the studio. It was a surprise because most studios today have 24 tracks or more all the way across. It's machines and technique and you name it. And here was, a, it looked like a storage house. It was an old metal door. A very old, old place. Kind of run down a bit. And I walked in. I was just a, it reminded me of my first recording of A Fool in Love. It was from three track to four track or something, it looked, eight track maybe it was the most. And here are these two young kids sitting there smiling and it was all of this space, not more. And I said to him, don't ever change it, keep it just like it is because this is where the real essence of sound comes from. And the place was really a storage place and I went in for the recordings, it was just kind of like I was in a, oh, some old kind of run down a little place, but it felt good. The sound, I felt like I could do it without the earphones, actually. It was, it was wonderful in the sense that somebody could do this work and not have to go into all of that advanced technology stuff. It was wonderful. I loved it. I loved the guys. They were, and I said, are you the one that really pulled that old stale song out and really made it happen? He said, yeah. He was kind of, not really shy, but young, you know. It was nice. Something special is also special to me because it's special for Tina Turner to be singing such a song. It's, it's unexpected. I loved it from the very beginning and it didn't go on the album before because it was that special and that different. 
This one, we, I insisted really. I said, I want it now because this is where I want to go in future. To have music that I can play at home, very relaxing, very mellow, very warm. The song precisely says what it is. It's special. It's unusual. And I'm very happy to have it on the album. Complicated Disaster is wonderful because, for me, the song is the energy of today. It's a hip song. The, even the style of it is, it's now. I'm very aware of what the kids are doing with music now compared to what they've taken from the past and what they've gone to. The story is age-old relationship problems. But the pattern and the, and the music even, it's just, and I had to really fight to keep that sound. They said, oh no, that was a demo track. And I said, yes, but it's good. Sometimes you can be lucky enough that the demo can become the master. And I had to really fight for that, to remain, remain that. And when I did actually speak to the producer, he says, no, 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 that was just a demo. That wasn't the record. And I said, but that's what I want for the record, because that's what I sung to. I learned the song to that. And to change the music away from what I was singing it to, it, it took the song away from me somehow. And then finally, two nights ago, they rang me up and said, okay, we're sending it in. Call back and let us know. And it was it. And I'm happy. I love it. It's, it's not a complicated disaster now. It's a success. <laughs> I, I do love it. River Deep came into my life at the most appropriate time one could imagine. I really needed something different. Um, it was so different that after each rehearsal, I could never remember the song after leaving the uh, Phil Spector. The sound of, when I was a little girl, this, that sound was so haunting. And, ah. Uh, I would not arrange a show without it. I have never done either of my live shows without it. It Unfortunately, America didn't take it, but other parts of the world, it just exploded. It's still a wonderful song, and even now on, the, on this album, it still sounds as fresh as ever. And that's one that works. Uh, it's still there, by the way. <laughs> Nutbush still is there in Tennessee, highway number 19. Still there, as real as life is. And on stage, when I'm playing that, just the first, da, 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 the place just goes crazy. It's just known. It, it, it happens to be the place where I was born and lived for a short period in my life. But it's, it, it's so descriptive to the song. The, the little community and uh, two versions my live version which I like very much and I like the original version that Ike recorded it, that is the recording on the, on the album because it's, it's, it's the recorded version the original recorded version and, and it's good I like it I do like better the live version because it's so much full of energy and I get the kids and the people going with me but uh, I'm happy I wrote it very happy I can proudly say that uh, it was a success and it's my hometown and I did it <laughs> oh, Mary. I call proud Mary, Mary. She's been around so long. But I have a story behind proud Mary. For as long as I have traveled up and down with Proud Mary and performed at television live, I had never met John Fogarty. And the last tour, he was invited. It was a surprise, I think, Roger, did it as a surprise, to open for me in the, um, I think, in the European uh, um, uh, concerts. 
and I was so happy to see him. I kind of felt like it was a baby that I carried so long, and finally here's the father, you know, the, the creator of it. And he stood there kind of like so shy or, or so different, and we actually sung the song together. He did his version, and then, of course, I did the up-tempo version, and it was a wonderful reunion. To me, it, it was a real closure because of that, a song that I had made my own, and it become of my life, of, of, of the part of my life, my life on stage. He, and to finally meet him and stand on stage and perform the song with him. It was so good. It was so great. It was a wonderful moment that I'll never forget. Before I met her, actually, I love her style. This is the best kind of work that she could do for herself and, and how she is. How she knew that uh, I don't want to fight no more would have been right for me was just her instincts because she, as a songwriter, I just think she has that knowledge to know that. Um, and it was. It was absolutely perfect because at the time I was just coming out of the hard times in my life and the song was, I think, is good for everyone that's going through that kind of a problem. Heaven 17, that was, that was an odd name for, for a group of people or for, for show business anyway. And even going in the studio was even more so. They were advanced. They were ahead of time then. There was some machine that I don't remember the name. Roger knows the name of this particular machine, but I'm sure it was some kind of a computer system then. I had never sang with such an instrument. I couldn't imagine. They're putting in a disc. It was like they were checking me for my heart or something. And then came the music. And I started to sing. And it was, the sound was unusual because it, it's as if they had recorded the track and put it onto this thing and put this thing in and I was singing. But it, it's not like how it is today. Nothing like that. Something else but weird, like a machine thing. And, and, and the mixture of how he came with, Ooh, let me say this. All of it was strange and different. I felt it was so strange, it kind of removed it from from Al Green's version because his was music, music, you could tell that it was just instruments and, and band. This was echoed and mixed, mixed differently. And this machine seemed like, seems like it gave it that sound. I couldn't imagine what was going on, but I just thought, okay, I love the song, I'll sing it, and uh, whatever comes out, that's it. But I wasn't sure what I would get because I was used to working with, um, you know, bands and studios and earphones and all of that stuff, and this was a totally different way of recording. I wish I could tell you what that was, but unfortunately, it was so weird that I, I, I think I didn't bring it with me, actually. <laughs> but uh, it's a success. Huh? Yeah, very much. I think the compliment that I got from Al Green was that he liked the smooth, the easiness that I sung it. I said, because of the arrangement. It was the sound of it and that arrangement. It was really quite unusual. Well, when I met Mark, of course, we're speaking of none other than Mark Knopfler. Roger had contacted him for music. This is private dancer time when we were looking for, trying to follow up with Let's Stay Together success, and we needed an album. And so Roger knew also Ed Bicknell, manager of Mark. And so they came with a song, and they said, Mark says that this song is not for a man. It's a girl song. He recorded it, but he won't use it. And so when I put the demo on, he, he said... I'm a private dancer, dancer for money, do what you want me to do. <laughs> well, I told him this, and so I thought, well, no, it's a, you're right, Mark, it's not a song for a guy. <laughs> and I, I, I liked it a lot. I wasn't sure whether the girl was a hooker or whether she was a very classical private dancer or what, but I thought, I'll take it. And uh, again, a great success. These are all good stories. What's love got to do with it was another one. 
uh, when I was given the demo, I just didn't like it. Um, coming from singing the Rolling Stones, Honky Tonk Woman, Rod Stewart's Hot Legs, uh, what's love got to do with what am I going to do with this song? How does this work? You know, this, uh, and, uh, this uh. so Rod kept pushing. He kept saying, no, Martina, it's a commercially good song. You know, I know you're not used to these kind of songs because you've never sung them, but I feel the song is a hit. So then he said, well, go and meet Terry and have Terry to just play it on the guitar for you. And I, I was really adamant about not being able to sing it that way. So he says, Terry will play it for you. He'll show you. So walk in the studio and little Terry is sitting there. Terry written, of course. Legs swinging on a stool with a guitar. And I thought, wow, you mean he wrote that song? I mean, the, the, the two go together somehow. What's love going to do? Ding, ding, ding. And he started to play the guitar. Oh, very good, by the way. Very, very good. And I thought, well, this is more like it, you know. Now I can sing to this. Because actually he just played the melody, just strumming it with guitar. And then I started to sing it. And of course, in the studio, he pulled it together for me because I had been used to singing that type of song. And... It was still odd for me, this song. I still couldn't get it. And then when I went to America to do some promotion, uh, I was a young, hip, hip kind of a girl was in a truck or in something. And she said, Tina Turner, what's love got to do with it? All right. And I said, ah, that's what it's about. Because love has everything to do with it. You know, we are taught to love your neighbor and everybody. And then all of a sudden, but there's another kind of what's love got to do with it. That's the message. And then I start to play with it on stage and to be able to perform it as I have for the rest of the time. We don't need another hero. Wow. Uh, I say often another one that I love, another one that was special because... The album is one that I love because all the songs are very special. Hero was a significance. We don't need another hero because it gives a memory of the movie. The song itself is a great story. It's a wonderful, very... I remember when singing it, I always felt that I should do something big or great or as someone wrote... We just wait, would like for Tina Turner to sing the song, but no, she has to make it heroic. That one, I needed to make it like I had been to war or something. I, Terry wrote this one as well. Terry Britton as well. Hero was the best soundtrack, I think, for Mad Max. The movie was absolutely the one that I wanted to do. Uh, shaving the head. The hair, well, it's how the kids look today, isn't it? But uh, that was how it was in the beginning. The dress, the I still wore my high heel shoes. I took my own shoes and transformed them in because I needed the whole look. Driving that car. When they brought the car in from Mad Max, I really felt like uh, I am the hero. I'm coming here. This is this is all about me. That this is a time in my life when it was all about me and my career and the best that I could be. It seemed like what I had done in the past was nothing compared to this because this is what I loved. This is what I wanted to do. And to finally stand in that costume and sing, we don't know, we don't want another hero. That just brought it right up to front. It was, uh, yeah, it was great. It was the best. <laughs> My meeting with David Bowie, when well, I'm sure as every girl would have wanted to have met David Bowie. David did something for me very special, very significant. When Let's Dance was coming out or at the time with what was happening with it, uh, he was with the company. At the time we were with the same company. I think it was then um, bu -bu 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 Capital. Of course it was Capital. And... Um, Contract had been signed, and they wanted to take David out to dinner. And David said, oh, no, I'm going to see my favorite, uh, my favorite singer tonight. So who is it? Tina Turner. Well, at the time, Capitol had decided not to sign me on. They were, mm, Roger was trying to get deals and whatever, and they just said, no, we think she's had it or whatever it was. So then they decided, oh, well, we'll go as well. And I was at the Ritz in New York City, 
and David came, of course. So was Rod Stewart there, so was Keith Richards. The place was packed full of stars and of all walks of life. The place was dripping from the ceilings they were hanging. It was hanging from the ceilings. They had a balcony there. It's, it, was, it, was so, it was so wonderful that night. I felt the energy that someone was there, but I always said to Roger, don't tell me if they're there because I'll get nervous. So, David, after that, it was because of David that I got the record deal. The company saw that. They thought, she is she's that popular I mean she has followers like this you know these people of this caliber is here to watch her so the contract was signed so after that David and I kind of kept in touch I did um, I invited him to come on stage and join me on stage for for we did let's dance together and after that then we recorded a song called uh, tonight and uh, that was a time in my life where I spent a lot of time with David and really found he's so smart. He's really a very special man. I can put it like that. And I think what he's done with his career has been extraordinary. I'm very happy to have known him. I always thank him for allowing that to happen for me, that gift from him, I'll have to say. Break Every Rule was when I was really rock and roll then. I had the leather jacket on my shoulder with the skull on the back of the leather jacket and the Elias tight clothes, big hair. I don't know where I had gotten the puffy, pouting mouth from at the time. It was, it was really my time. And then came the typical male. But this one was also when I met my love, uh, German-born, um, typical male. It was a... Memorable because at that time our relationship was full on, so it's special for that. But also it was special because it made a great video. And again, lyrically, it's a good song. The most serious song was Paradise is Here. Paradise is Here, when it came to me, it just kind of, I was just kind of frozen because it was a, not a blues, but a really strong ballad, a, a mournful kind of, uh, someone pleading for a relationship some kind of way. And where, where I placed it in, in my show, I was at Woburn Abbey, I remember it more than any other places where I was. And I came back out for an encore, white shirt, jeans then. That was really something, to change from the dresses into the jeans. And I stood there very quietly and looked out over the grounds, and it was packed full of people. And as I waved, they waved back. And I started to sing Paradise is Here, and the whole place just came with me. It was, you can see it on the video now, on some of the videos where it is. It's still, the magic of it is. And the song is still as strong as it ever was. It's a great song. Well, Tony and I come from the same background, so we know all about steamy windows or whatever. And um, the song, the energy of the song was good. I, I like the arrangement because I love Tony's style. And um, it was just kind of up. I Don't Want to Lose You was another one of Terry Britton's songs. It's again very moody like that one was not in the way sad but some kind of way they were sad but yet happy sad. It wasn't depressing. That's another one I loved. I was thrilled because I was a Pierce Brosnan was as close as you could get to Sean Connery because nobody could top Sean Connery yet. And I thought, well, that's a good choice, and I loved it. And to finally sing a Bond song, oh, that was, I mean, can't top Shirley Bassey, I have to say that. But I was happy that I even had the chance to sing a Bond song. And it was close to, very close to her song. Actually, the connection, the song came from YouTube of Bono and uh, Edge. The song came and he said to me, Tina, it's very rough, but I'm sure you can probably suss it out. 
It was so, so rough. It was on a ghetto blaster. I think he had probably just put it roughly down somewhere near the water. It wasn't clear. I couldn't get any sense of it. But I didn't care because I wanted to do it. So I said to Raj, no, 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 no. I, I'll learn it. And then when I'm with them and hear the, the music, then I, can be, I would be able to sing it. Because what was also special is that Bono and his wife had been at the house of Ian Fleming. And he and, his, they, uh, he and his wife either became engaged there or was married there. So for him to write the song, or to have been invited to write the song, was very special to him. Special to me because I had a chance to sing it and to work for the first time with Bino and Edge. Well, we got in the studio and I started to sing. And I had the most wonderful compliment from him. This is, we're still talking about uh, Golden Eye. He complimented by saying, complimented my vocals. He said, ah, I should have known. Your voice is, is equivalent to uh, uh, an instrument. But for as long as you have been singing and, and the experience that you had, I should have known that. And I was able to do absolutely every little twist and turn he wanted. So I was thrilled. I was thrilled to please uh, the writers and to sing the Bond song and to finally get a chance to be in the Bond company. So that was another great time. Silent Wings is and always was a sad song to me. Um, I don't know how to tell you how I related to it, but it was one that I incorporated in the show, and I thought it was special, but it was a moment also kind of dealing with my pianist had passed, and I was able to bring in all of the sad things in my life to be able to relate to that particular song. But it showed... A side of me that is quite unlike I am on stage. It's uh, it it brings memories of the sad memories that you want to remember. That's uh, that song reflects that, and I felt that it should be a part of this album for people that that need need that particular song for certain times in their lives. I was in Germany, at the, I lived in Germany at the time when I first heard oh. Oh. I just needed that song so badly. And then my musicians came to see me because they were on tour with someone. I said, listen to this song. They didn't like it. So I thought, okay, fine. Then I had an anniversary and I said to Irvin, Irvin Bach, my companion, I said, please, you have to invite Ramazati, or what we call him Ramazati, Eros, because I have to meet him. So, through record company, we managed to get in touch with Eris. He came with his wife, Michelle, at the time, and the whole, his whole crowd, the, the manager, the, uh, the lawyer, the, <laughs> you cannot believe this whole bunch of people came. It was funny because there's so much fun. And he was so cute at the time. Well, he still is, but he was cuter then. And I had a little, Little kind of a crush as a fan, like that, you know. So it was perfect to sing the song with him because it was it's kind of flirtatious and you know Italian. But I said to him, you're not allowed to touch or pat or nothing. So, but we got along great. It, I loved singing the song with him. I actually went on a European tour with him for about four dates. We got along absolutely great. We became great friends afterwards, and we still are. Brother Bear, Great Spirits, uh, the Disney project for the animated movies. I'd worked with them before uh, on other, um, some other projects. So this time I was contacted from the same, but this time I had a chance to work directly with Phil Collins, and uh, which Phil and I know each other because we've worked from time to time, uh, Princess Trust, and from time to time with other projects. And so this one was actually one that he had just written, actually, and I like it. Yeah, I, I liked doing those songs because they're different it, it gives you something else something different to do um, from the normal work of my career um, and working with with Phil is always special because he's 
he's such a great songwriter. He, he, he writes such great songs. He sings so great. And he loves his work so much. You know, he's just always there. And I would never say no to Disney because uh, starting from Itina up until now, we've gotten along great and it's just another home. All the best. Coming, of course, from Simply the Best, which I would have to say, yes, is the best. And that song arrived years ago. I performed it years and years. People cover it. It's on commercials. It's everywhere because it's a special song. But Simply the Best, as you say, it is taken on because it's, it's, it's sung about someone. It has taken on another feeling of how people feel about me in terms of my professional side, my personal side. What is the difference in those two? Well, I'll try to get around to that, but we're talking about the song at the moment. It will last. Simply Best is an anthem. It's a song where I felt that it didn't necessarily have to be about two people. That is between animal, beauty of a car, a horse, a, a thing. And that is what I sung about. That is why I did the video, of course, being, riding a horse, saying this is just, just the best moment of when the wind is in your hair and you're riding and you're the freedom of all of that. It covers a lot of things, the best. But I think how the people has taken it is like, Tina, you're the best. And I think a, a question was asked to me once, do you get up in the morning and look in the mirror and say to yourself, oh, you're Tina Turner and you're the best? Oh, my answer was, absolutely no. I... I'm far removed from my, my stage, uh, how to say, persona when I'm home. I, I have never allowed Tina Turner to totally take over my life. I love being me too much. I love me more than I love the personification of uh, my career. Yeah, my career. It's two totally separate, uh, if we can call it, entities. On stage, I'm performing. Short dress, hair, I'm giving a show. I like to give the show the wholehearted, every, in, every inch of whatever I can do to please the people. But off stage, I consider myself really a great person. <laughs> I like me very much. I like anime bullock. Um, it's a different personality because I'm not acting. I'm myself. And I'm enjoying that very much, even now. <laughs>